Okay, if we could get started, uh, please. I'm Dick Fallon from here at Harvard uh, Law School. I want to join those who thank the organizers of this uh, splendid uh, conference. Um, for our panel, uh, the procedure uh, will be as follows. I will give a couple of sentences of introduction of each of the panelists. Uh, then, after each of the panelists has spoken for no more than 10 uh, minutes, we may have a little bit of conversation up here among our ourselves about what each of the speakers has had uh, to say. Um, then we will move uh, with relative briskness toward a time at the end when we'll open things up for anybody from the audience uh, to say anything he or she wants and to put any questions that he or she might like to any one of the panelists. Uh, the panelists in the order uh, they're going to speak uh, will be Phil Hyman, professor here at Harvard Law School head of the criminal uh, division during the Carter uh, administration and then deputy administration, uh, deputy attorney general during the Clinton uh, administration. As all you know well, he's written, written widely and influentially about national security matters. Uh, second will be Ben uh, Wisner, uh, the litigation director of the ACLU's national security uh, project. Uh, he too has written widely and influentially on national security issues and has also litigated a number of important cases uh, regarding the government's post-9-11 practices. Uh, third uh, will be Jerry Newman, a uh, professor here at Harvard Law School, and since January, a member of the Human Rights Committee, uh, the premier body in the UN's human rights uh, system. Uh, and so somebody who is uh, experienced uh, internationally as well as domestically uh, dealing with issues of the kind we'll be talking about. Uh, and then finally, Trevor Morrison of Columbia uh, Law School. Uh, he's written a lot about constitutional law and national security uh, law, and he was very recently a special assistant and associate counsel uh, to the president. Um, and so without uh, further uh, ado, Phil, the clock is running on your 10 minutes. <laughs> It's already started? <laughs> okay. Uh, I am afraid that I'm going to sound like uh, the, the sky is falling down on American civil liberties. I don't want to sound that way because I don't believe that's true. But I do want to point out what's moving in subtle ways and the dangers of that subtle movement. Good way to start is to uh, talk about the major things that the government could do to a citizen in August of 2001. It could search your home, your car, your person, your office. It could engage in electronic surveillance, all with judicial approval. It could subpoena your papers if it had an investigation going as to which they were relevant. It could arrest you. That, would be, that was the form of detention or stop you. Uh, and once it did that, it could interrogate you as long as it gave you a lawyer, offered you a lawyer. It could detain you for trial. These are sort of the powers that you were up against. And uh, it could convict you of a well-defined crime. It has to be pretty well-defined. But that had to be for some act you had done or, well, or were well on the way to doing an attempt or a conspiracy. Uh, these five dangers from government, these five things you might fear from your government, had well-established requirements enforced in each case by judges, by judicial review after the fact or by judicial approval before the fact. And that's about what the government could do to you. The steps that I've described, the arrest, the, uh, the interrogation, the conviction, these are all, all had to be event triggered. That means that they could only take place if there was some reasonable basis for taking that step at that time. It had to be a suspicion of a crime. Since the Vietnam War, that's when we really got worried about it, and the time of Richard Nixon, the police in the United States going up to August 2001 were broadly forbidden to engage in general surveillance, uh, intelligence, it was called intelligence gathering. Now it's widely commended, 
it's what we seek in the way of protection, you couldn't use the word intelligence if you were a police chief in August uh, 2001. Um, that, now, uh, that event triggering covered uh, both what the police did, the police couldn't initiate the, an investigation under various uh, arrangements between the federal government and police and under FBI guidelines unless they had uh, a basis for the investigation, no, not general intelligence gathering, and they couldn't demand records. Even demanding records, they required a grand jury subpoena, easy to get, but it had to be part of a grand jury investigation. Uh, the protections against the things that the government could do to you were largely constitutional and not at the deference or with the approval of the president or the president and Congress. Finally, our military and intelligence agencies were kept far away from domestic law enforcement. Uh, the Posse Comitatus Act took care of the military, the presidential order establishing the CIA uh, took care of uh, the intelligence agencies. Now, what's happened in the last 10 years? The sky isn't falling down, but things are shifting. And it's worth noting. Um, we've come to accept presidential powers not exercised much, only very rarely, if ever, exercised to detain and kill Americans without trial. That's pretty stunning. We've come to accept it as an unexercised power under the authorization for use of military force. Um, and we've come to accept, although the president hasn't ever claimed this power, even in writing, the right of the president to try Americans before military commissions. I'm making a distinction here between practices that you might fear, and none of these are practices, and the authority that we've come to concede somewhere in the back of our minds that is no longer questioned. The Quirin decision, bad decision, rigged decision, presidential influence decision has become established and admired law with regard to military commissions saying that you can try Americans before military commissions. We've come to accept that this is a war and so that the powers of war are available to the president. We've uh, come to accept a substantial shift towards a surveillance state. Um, the, the people in the United States have always had two, I'm looking at my watch nervously for fear of Professor Fallon, um, <laughs> have always had two protections of their privacy. One is judicial protections and legal protections in the case of electronic surveillance. The other, since the time of uh, Jefferson and Madison, has been the protection that you get by being in a place from which normal people cannot hear and cannot see what you're doing. In other words, walking in the Cambridge Common at a considerable distance from anybody else, you had privacy with the person you were walking with to say what you wanted. Since September 11, 2001, uh, we've developed We've poured money into surveillance technology, which makes the public locations where we used to enjoy privacy and where Madison and Hamilton and Jefferson and Washington and Adams enjoyed privacy, public, they, have, they are now open game. They are no longer places where you can rely on your privacy. We've changed the system for demand for records. Now you the FBI can demand records with the national security letter without any uh, either basis or judicial uh, review. Uh, 24,000 records were obtained last year on 14,000 Americans in that way. Um, 
We've come to assume that broad intelligence gathering and exchange that includes the military and our intelligence agencies is an unqualifiedly good thing. Well, it is a good thing for some reasons, for some purposes, but it's not an unqualifiedly good thing. And if the CIA is coaching the New York police on how to surveil the Muslim community, which they are, that's not a good thing. We don't need the CIA there. The New York police, I, I know both the New York Police Department and the CIA and New York Police Department can do it better. Uh, we have, as I've said, poured money into new surveillance technology and we've also, in the name of counterterrorism, and we've also uh, shaped all sorts of additional agendas in the direction of counterterrorism. Agendas for uh, nonprofits, uh, for uh, civil society, for charitable activities, uh, particularly abroad. All right, um, we've uh, a thousand policemen in New York devoted wholly to counterterrorism, 750 in Los Angeles. We have proudly merged local policing such state policing as there is with federal policing in uh, merger, merged centers throughout the country. Okay, I, I, what, so what does this mean? I don't think we're, I think our liberties are very considerable and people can act with very considerable absence of fear, but the ground is shifting and it's shifting out of the consequences of fear, it's, it's shifting because fear outweighs our concerns about living in a tolerably surveillance-free society. Now, I was going to say, but they're not very interesting what I would do about that, but I've got three co-panelists and a colleague to fear, so I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Well, I would ask the first uh, question, Phil, and I guess uh, I might just ask you to go ahead and say a few more sentences about what you would do uh, about the trends that you're talking about, because is, there's an overtone of menace about what uh, you say. Uh, not exactly the sky uh, is falling, but uh, we ought to be worried about that uh, prospect, but there are clearly other things to be worried about, too, so a few sentences about what we ought to do. Okay, the main thing is to well, the, the easy step is to be sure that surveillance, which is by, defini by definition has to be secret. It, you can't surveil somebody who knows you're surveilling them. That as much as possible about any uh, surveillance be made public, as much as is possible without ruining the purpose of the surveillance. We should be questioning the state's secret doctrine uh, very uh, seriously. I, I think we have a, I think we probably have an acceptable policy with regard to targeted killing, though I would never in, expand it to an American as the Obama administration seems to have done without a congressional authorization. But nobody knows what that policy is. You can't give out the list of who's on a targeted killing list but you can say how it works, how the list is made up, who has to approve it. I think the president is approving it at the highest level, but you have to be able to, you have to say those things and make them known. You have to remember that prevention is self-fulfilling. Once you engage in prevention steps, if nothing happens, the people who are taking those steps will claim that it's because of the prevention. The other alternative is because the threat was exaggerated. I can remember when people could walk in and out of the Justice Department building. It could, you could just come in off the street and walk into the Justice Department building, threatening the lives of the 30,000 uh, bureaucrats in there. When I, uh, I, I just have to tell you, I went down, and then I'm gonna stop, the, the, I went down at time of the administration change, and they hadn't appointed a 
deputy attorney general yet, so a long time career guy, just very good career guy, but just like you would imagine a career guy, was acting as deputy attorney general. We arranged to have lunch across the street from the Justice Department. He was driven across the street. If I told you his name, which I don't want to do, it, there isn't a chance in a million that anybody in the room would know it. Hmm. He was driven across the street in an armored car with Secret Service protection. Well, we have, we have to come down hard on excessive uh, fears. And uh, above all, we have to try to be rational about our fears. I should quit. Okay, so uh, just uh, quickly, other panelists, any uh, comments on what Phil had to say? Maybe especially with respect to what purported to be the empirical aspects of his uh, account, the way things have changed 2001 to 2011. Is everybody pretty much on board with that? I am. Tra Trevor, are you on board with that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there, I, I, I don't think um, Phil necessarily intended this, but the, the history that at some point sounded like it, it sort of jumped from the privacy that uh, Madison and Hamilton enjoyed to 9-11, um, and I think that, you know, a lot of the changes are sort of, you know, functions of technology and surveillance and changes in police practices that, have, you know, have been moving as technology has moved over time. That's not to, you know, d deny the significance of 9-11 in, in both in its sort of way it changed people's attitudes about uh, dramatic threats to the security of the nation and in uh, then changes in the legal architecture that empowered the government to do things it couldn't have done before. Uh, and that attempted in various ways to regulate that activity. Um, but I guess um, I'm, I'm not sure I was at, at points unsure about the empirical claim, whether it was that sort of legal powers have dramatically expanded in a way that we would have thought was sort of categorically off the table before, or whether the occasion of 9-11 has caused the government sometimes to feel it needs to exercise some powers that would have, there would have been very, very few occasions in the past for it to exercise those powers, but not necessarily a consensus that it was impossible uh, for the government you know, to have that authority. If it's, if it's a claim more about the sort of frequency of exercise of certain powers after 9-11, I think I'm on board with the empirical claim. If it's, a, if it's a claim about sort of going from a kind of consensus about the sort of categorical unconstitutionality of certain practices to a now consensus categorically that says, well, that's constitutional, um, I'm, I'm less certain that that's a good description overall of the change post 9-11. Okay, so in uh, terms of making sure that everybody has ample opportunity to talk, I think we'll go on to the next speaker and then we'll come to audience uh, questions at the end and sort of leave hanging uh, for the moment what I take to be the issue between uh, Trevor and uh, Phil about whether powers have changed or just occasions for exercise of powers have become more uh, frequent since 9-11. Uh, uh, and so uh, next, Ben. Thanks, Professor Fallon. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I, I confess I feel slightly out of place, surrounded by so much tenure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it reminds me, I spoke a couple of years ago at the law school at Berkeley, uh, and there was the predictable question from a student, uh, how is it possible that John Yu, who was the architect of the torture program, is allowed to come back here and keep his tenure? You know, my answer was, uh, I've said before, and I'll say it again, that I think that Professors Yu, Professor Yu's role in the torture conspiracy should be criminally investigated, but tenure is a completely different matter. <laughs> uh, I think they thought I was kidding, and I think you think I was kidding, but I wasn't about either. Uh, I, I am very, very grateful to be included uh, in the left corner of Ben Wittes's big tent. Uh, um, uh, I do think that it is critically, critically important and long overdue uh, for us to have open, honest, and fearless conversations about the topics that are being addressed at this conference. Uh, we need to bring to those conversations both open minds and thick skins, 
Uh, we don't want to set out in advance any parameters of respectable opinion or serious opinions as opposed to radical ones. Uh, I think we are off to an excellent start um, in the last day, uh, and I congratulate Gabby and Ben and everyone else responsible uh, for this effort. Uh, and in fact, uh, the discussion about these issues is going to be the topic of my remarks today more than any particular policy, but I'm sure we'll get into some of that uh, in the question period. Uh, we're uh, well on into the season of 9-11 10-year anniversary events. Uh, I have somewhat of a personal connection to this, having begun at the ACLU in August of 2001, so it is my own 10-year uh, anniversary as well. Uh, and I know that the thrust of this conference is supposed to be towards uh, looking forward and not looking back. It will come as no surprise to anyone here uh, that I believe that it's necessary to look back before uh, moving forward. Uh, there's two things that I never could have predicted uh, on that awful morning in September. Uh, the first is that terrorists would not succeed in mounting another major strike uh, on U.S. soil in the decade to follow. Uh, the second is that to a very large degree, many of our political leaders would behave as if they had succeeded in carrying out such an attack. Uh, we heard Bobby Chesney uh, say last night that a decade after 9-11, um, we continue to permit terrorism, I would say the fear of terrorism, uh, to dominate our political and our legal discourse. Uh, that by defining the struggle against terrorism in existential terms uh, as a war that takes place everywhere, uh, that may well last forever, uh, we have, in effect, enshrined a permanent state of emergency in our law and politics uh, in which terrorist threats are not contextualized, uh, in which core values can be set aside uh, next to ever-expanding demands of national security. Uh, it has been said already at this conference, and it should be said at every panel, uh, that terrorism will not be eliminated. Uh, but neither need we treat it as a threat equivalent to world wars in which millions of people were extinguished, uh, a cold war in which the whole world lived under threat of nuclear holocaust, uh, or a civil war in which our nation's survival was in peril. Uh, I think that one of the problems is that our political leaders uh, have refused to address the American public as adults uh, in the way um, that I just did and in the way that others at this conference have. Uh, rather than working to allay public fear and contextualize the threat of terrorism, uh, they've manipulated those fears uh, to the point where it is difficult for me sometimes to determine whether uh, our leaders are, are actually afraid of what they say they're afraid of uh, or whether they're pretending to be afraid. Uh, is it possible that any member of Congress actually believes that U.S. prisons are not secure enough to hold terrorism suspects safely? Uh, is it remotely conceivable that a member of Congress believes his own warning that if Khalid Sheikh Mohammed were brought to the U.S. for trial, he might be released on a technicality, granted asylum, and find himself on a path to citizenship? Uh, this was stated on the record. Now, if these leaders truly hold these beliefs, they're fools or cowards. If they don't, but pretend they do, they're cynics. Uh, I think that that cynicism has been emboldened by a political discourse that has rewarded leaders who have inflated the terrorist threat uh, and marginalized those who have attempted to contextualize it. So those leaders who proclaim that Muslim terrorists represented an unprecedented threat to our way of life, that our existing laws, courts, and institutions, even our prisons, were inadequate in the face of this threat, that we had no choice but to dispense with core principles, even the long-standing prohibition against torturing prisoners, to defeat this ruthless enemy, uh, saw themselves extolled as hard-nosed realists, warriors who were willing to take the gloves off. By contrast, those who defended the vitality of our system, who insisted that our existing institutions were equal to the challenges posed by transnational terrorism, who demanded that we abide by core principles, including fair trials for and humane treatment of prisoners, even if that meant that terrorism suspects must be released and political leaders must be criminally investigated, were dismissed as naive 
I think that this dynamic was driven in part by a wholly contrived political debate over whether the threat of terrorism called for a military or a law enforcement response. Uh, a debate that I think had more to do with the self-image of the would-be warriors than with the reality of counterterrorism. Um, confronting the terrorist threat unquestionably involves both military and law enforcement resources. Um, certainly, no one advocated sending the New York Police Department to Kandahar in 2001 to battle al-Qaeda-trained militias, except perhaps the New York Police Department. Uh, by the same token, no one, or almost no one, would advocate that Navy SEALs conduct night raids in Brooklyn to capture or kill a U.S. citizen terrorism suspect. Uh, the question is not whether to employ a military or a law enforcement response, but where to draw the appropriate line between the two. Uh, my belief is that in the last decade, we've allowed a superficial rhetoric of a war on terror to solidify into a set of policies that push that line too much in the direction of a military response. In a, in a very provocative article by the self-described liberal hawk George Packer in the New Yorker's 9-11 issue, uh, Packer challenged, I think himself, but also all of us, to explore the roots of our reactions to 9-11. Uh, Packer writes, at the time of the attacks, few educated Americans born after 1950 had any direct experience of war or persecution or cataclysmic failure. After 9-11, this gap in the resumes of intellectuals gave them both a sense of inadequacy, an outbreak of envy for the greatest generation, and a compensatory tendency to inflate the drama of the war on terror and their own role in it. Uh, those are challenging remarks. Uh, I think the comparison to the greatest generation is apt for another reason. That generation lived through a conflict in which 50 million people perished. Uh, several 9-11s per day, every day, for six years. Uh, what emerged from that conflict were the Geneva Conventions and the Nuremberg Trials. What has emerged from the crucible of 9-11? Ten years after those attacks, we have not had our Nuremberg. Uh, in fact, the perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of that attack have not faced trial anywhere. Uh, instead, we had a military commission trial of Osama bin Laden's driver. Uh, and I think that this is a result of our having sent those suspects to secret prisons rather than to open courts. Uh, yesterday, Julia Kayyem asked a question that, that really could be the subject of an entire conference. Uh, she asked, what are the conditions for ratcheting down? Now, she was talking about, in that particular instance, stationing National Guard soldiers outside a nuclear facility. But what about the extensive authorities that Phil discussed in his remarks? Can anyone here articulate or even imagine a scenario in which those authorities will be scaled back? Uh, as Phil said, the absence of attacks is seen as proof of their success. But if there were more attacks, it would not be seen as proof of their failure, but as a need for more authority. Uh, and so the pendulum swings in one direction without ever swinging back. Uh, in, in a much cited lecture uh, delivered near the end of the Cold War, uh, Justice Brennan, no, no relation, I think, to John Brennan, uh, reflected on the shabby treatment that civil liberties have received in our country during times of war and perceived threats. Uh, Justice Brennan noted the cyclical nat nature of our nation's response to traumatic events. After each crisis had abated, the country had, in his words, remorsefully realized the abrogation of civil liberties was unnecessary. Uh, and while Justice Brennan hoped that the nation would eventually develop a jurisprudence that would be able to withstand this crucible of danger, uh, there was comfort at least in the recognition that our system of government was self-correcting over time. I think the unique danger with articulating a war against terrorism or even against Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups is that the end of that kind of conflict is a distant abstraction, not an actual, predictable, concrete, definable event. We might not have known when those prior conflicts or traumas would end, but we had some sense of how. Um, Ten years have passed since 9-11. Uh, Al-Qaeda's leader, many of his deputies have been killed. We heard last night from John Brennan that Al-Qaeda is on the ropes. Uh, at a time when we should be having a serious discussion about the conditions for ratcheting down, 
Uh, instead, we have debates and votes in Congress uh, about authorizing an even more loosely defined armed conflict that would give the President more and not less war authority than he has. Uh, I see from this note that my time is up. Uh, I have more to say about, I think, what the debate ought to be on these issues, uh, but, but we'll have time for that afterwards. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. So uh, just one comment on the um, notion that our politics surrounding counterterrorism have become pathological. Um, wouldn't it be surprising if they had become anything other uh, than pathological, given what is happening in the rest of our uh, politics and the way that the country has generally responded uh, to past threats uh, and crises? So that's uh, a comment. The question, it's a very broad uh, one, but you observe that the absence of attacks since 9-11 is often cited as proof of the success of some of the policies that you are very critical of. Um, what's your response to that common observation? Uh, so the first question is about how toxic the politics of national security have become. Was that not inevitable? Uh, you know, I hope that efforts like this one will be aimed at uh, making these discussions less toxic. Uh, but I would point out here that they have not been toxic in the same way for 10 years. Um, issues that were not controversial during a Republican president uh, have become real flashpoints during a Democratic president. So, uh, for example, when the attempted shoe bomber Richard Reed was arrested by the FBI and prosecuted in a federal court, uh, I don't remember any criticism of that by Republicans or Democrats in Congress. When the same thing was done with the attempted underwear bomber, um, you saw very, very shrill, loud, rancorous partisan attacks on how the president uh, was not keeping us safe and was not keeping us secure. So I do think that this is not so much a function of the national trauma uh, as it is a function of how hyper-partisan our party system has become and how every issue, including national security issues, are refracted through that partisan prism. Uh, we talked yesterday about what level of risk is tolerable. You can ask that question when it comes to national security, but I think you also have to ask that question when it comes to politics, because my belief is that many of the positions that this administration have taken uh, have been taken because of the political rather than national security risks associated with going in the other direction. Um, how do I respond to, to the very, very fair question, um, which is that, you know, doesn't in some sense the record speak for itself? Uh, how many Americans have been killed by terrorists on our soil since 9-11? It depends how you count. Uh, maybe 17, if you include 14 at Fort Hood. Um, and isn't this some way a vindication um, of those policies? And the truth is that uh, it is virtually impossible for me to answer that question. And, and there are people in this room who have had more access to intelligence, to information, have been part of the national security apparatus, who, who are or could be in a better position to answer that if, uh, if much of that information were not classified. I'd only repeat the point that I made in my remarks. Um, which is that it is really unanswerable. Um, had there been more attacks in the last 10 years, I don't think the rep proponents uh, of added surveillance authority, of secret prisons, of enhanced interrogation would have conceded that they were wrong and that we should swing back. They would have said, we need even more. Uh, and so we need to find a way to have a discussion of this that doesn't sort of stay um, within that very, very narrow lens. So, Trevor, I don't mean uh, to turn you into the permanent panel hawk uh, here, uh, but you've had a chance to observe uh, from the inside some of the decision making, and I'm sure you've had plenty of occasion to reflect on some of the politics uh, surrounding the decision uh, making. Um, any thoughts in response to what uh, Ben has just said? I, I, well, yes. Um, uh, in fact, some of what I'll, I'll say in my uh, uh, sort of uh, own 10 minutes will, will speak to, I think, an uh, overlapping set of problems um, and pathologies. And I think a lot of the description, um, at least some of the description, I think, I think is uh, quite right. I, maybe for now I'll just offer one thought on the, it's, it, it's quite a um, provocative um, and in many ways quite right observation to say, look, on the one hand, we can't know for sure that any of the measures the government's employed in the last 10 years has, has at least the public can't know for sure, what, if any, um, sort of imminent threats 
have been disrupted as a result of those policies. Um, yet, if there were some massive you know, attack along the lines of 9-11 in the past five years, the response would not likely have been by, by very many people to you know, sort of ratchet back. I, I'm not entirely convinced that that's as paradoxical as it sounds like. Um, I mean, I, if you just translate it into some other sort of government addressing a problem, um, you know, it's attempting to address a problem with a series of measures that are not total war. Uh, and then, you know, a big cataclysm happens that maybe suggests that the risk is more profound than had been understood before. I think it's right that the government likely would then, you know, feel pressure to ask what else can be done to try and stop these kinds of attacks. And so there is a one-wayness to it, but I don't know that that's uh, sort of internally contradictory. I think that's in the nature of a government responding to threats. I think what it means is that, um, that the question that, that, that Ben sort of reposed, that Juliet posed yesterday, is a really good one, which is what are going to be the sort of conditions that would exist to ratchet back, and how would it work? Which institution of government would be dictating it? Would it be done pursuant to legal command or a kind of discretionary decision? Those are all good uh, questions institutionally and sort of you know, raise questions about the conditions that would have to exist to go that way. But I think that the, the, the point that another attack would not likely cause us to abandon as many uh, 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 policies as, as add new ones is, I think, right, but um, doesn't by itself reflect anything sort of deeply wrong or pathological about government in this area. Um, there are many people who would love to talk, uh, I'm sure, Ben uh, foremost uh, among them, uh, but so that we have a chance for everybody at the end, I'm going to try to keep the uh, trains running reasonably on time. So, Jerry Newman. Thank you. Um, the two previous speakers have been rather depressing on the subject of domestic civil liberties, so I think it's time for a change, uh, and I will be depressing on the subject of international <laughs> law. <laughs> Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, of this conference, uh, and particularly Gabby Bloom, whose contributions I'm, I'm most aware of. Uh, I also want to say, as a, as in terms of introduction, that I'm speaking today in my personal capacity. I'm obliged to say this. Uh, I'm not speaking uh, on behalf of the Human Rights Committee, uh, and I want to reassure you uh, that when the United States appears before the Human Rights Committee, I will be recused from participating uh, because I'm a U.S. national. Uh, so nothing that I'm about to say reflects on uh, the Human Rights Committee uh, or how the, the U.S. will be treated by the Human Rights Committee. Uh, I want to talk about the challenges of domestic counterterrorism from an international human rights perspective, uh, which often overlaps but does not coincide with the United States constitutional rights perspective. Uh, the first point I want to make quickly but vehemently uh, is that terrorism is itself a horrendous human rights violation. Uh, the 9-11 attacks were mass murder of innocent civilians. Uh, Shivli Malat earlier today characterized them as a crime against humanity. Uh, the human rights community is very aware of this. Obviously, the United States has a duty, also from the human rights perspective, to protect the lives of its citizens, its residents, and its visitors. Uh, the challenge of domestic counterterrorism is to provide that protection without trampling on the other rights of its citizens, its residents, and its visitors. Uh, in the first years uh, after the uh, attacks of 2001, uh, the incumbent administration did not take that concern as seriously as it should have. Um, I may be repeating phrases that uh, were just spoken by Ben, uh, but uh, it was time to take the gloves off, was the common phrase. Uh, there are students in the audience, despite the fact that it's Saturday, some of you may be too young to remember the details. Uh, for me, one symbolic low point occurred in the case of Jose Padilla. Uh, Jose Padilla was a United States citizen who was arrested on US soil on suspicion of association with Al Qaeda. The government initially detained him as a material witness in New York, uh, but then the president designated him as an enemy combatant, uh, and he was whisked off to a Navy brig in South Carolina without notice to his attorney. Uh, 
Uh, when his attorney tried to challenge his detention on habeas corpus, the government not only argued that they were entitled to hold him incommunicado without hearing, uh, but insisted that he should not be given any access of counsel whatsoever because knowledge that his detention was being challenged would decrease his total dependence on his interrogators <laughs> and therefore would be counterproductive to the interrogation. Uh, that is the extent of the authority that the president claimed uh, over all of us at home. Uh, Padilla's case was ultimately mooted and he was transferred back to the criminal justice system to avoid a resolution of this dispute. Uh, the court's decision in the case of Hamdi versus Rumsfeld demonstrates uh, that Padilla should at least have had a hearing. Uh, I might add from the international human rights perspective that his prolonged incommunicado detention was inherently inhuman treatment, uh, putting aside the various methods of interrogation that were actually uh, employed with regard to him. Uh, there have been a few cases since 2001 placing limits on how the government can treat its own citizens and non-citizens as well, uh, but there have been far too few. Practice in the United States has improved since the Abu Ghraib scandal, uh, but most of the improvement has been through voluntary restraint. Uh, and there are too few safeguards in place for situations that may change because of another attack within our borders <coughs> or because a different administration sweeps them away. I think that is my main message for today. Uh, US culture has an ambivalent relationship with torture. Uh, we condemn it vehemently when the bad guys do it, uh, but there's also a popular celebration of the rebel detective who sets aside the rules and does whatever he deems necessary. Uh, in the wake of 2001, there was an entire television series whose theme was the glorification of torture in the name of national security. Uh, against this background, the general impunity for crimes in counterterrorism policy that has prevailed in this country creates a serious problem. I know this panel is supposed to be looking forward, not backward, uh, and the Obama administration's policy has been to look forward, not backward. Uh, I also understand why that was expedient or politically necessary, uh, and it may be even more necessary politically in the poisonous political environment that we have today. Uh, I agree that the poisonous character of the political environment is not solely, perhaps not primarily, a result uh, of the 2001 attacks. Uh, but it leaves a great challenge for public education. Uh, and alternative methods of reframing public expectations have not been implemented either. Uh, some of the authors of these crimes brazenly claim them as achievements. Uh, others are celebrated as experts and given speaking engagements. The country is not being prepared to respect the human rights of mere suspects who may well be innocent, let alone to respect the human rights of the guilty who also have human rights. Uh, as all the world knows, the then incumbent administration abused the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base as a zone where detainees had no rights. Uh, it ignored international criticism until ultimately the Supreme Court was embarrassed to acting uh, in first the Razul and then the Boumediene decision. Uh, President Obama proposed closing the detention facilities at Guantanamo, uh, but Congress has obstructed him from achieving this. Meanwhile, the DC Circuit has resisted the Boumediene decision and has refused to recognize any due process rights for Guantanamo detainees until the Supreme Court explicitly tells it to do so. Uh, for these and other reasons, the Guantanamo base remains as a standing temptation to future administrations and for future crises uh, to reenact the crimes and the blunders of the past. Uh, to give another illustration, uh, the then incumbent administration and the Congress produced some grotesquely overbroad terrorism laws. Uh, terrorism is notoriously difficult to define and some of our statutes don't make an effort to do so. Uh, there are provisions codified in our immigration laws, but which also have broader civil consequences, which essentially define terrorist activity as including any act of violence against persons or property that is not for profit, period. 
uh, and any form of association with persons who perform such acts. Uh, these laws have proved to be a useful model for dictatorships uh, who want to suppress their critics and their political opponents in the name of complying with the United Nations counterterrorism mandates, uh, and they directly cite the United States as their model. The United States government has not employed these laws that broadly, uh, but again, it is partly a matter of voluntary restraint, and under the right circumstances, it could do so. In immigration matters, bureaucrats who go by the book have actually caused serious problems, which Congress has partly addressed by creating voluntary waiver provisions. Uh, problems created by applying these anti-terrorism provisions to legitimate armed movements opposing repressive governments that the United States itself condemns. In fact, any alien who, quote, endorses or espouses, unquote, terrorism, is deportable. Uh, and I have just told you how broadly terrorist activity is defined. Uh, these laws may be technically consistent with the First Amendment to the extent that they are applied to immigrants, uh, but they are not consistent with the international human right to freedom of expression. Uh, at the best of times, broad anti-terrorism laws are popular to pass and unpopular to correct. Uh, these are neither the best of times nor the worst of times, uh, but the challenge is going forward whether to preserve or to increase respect for human rights in counterterrorism policy are enormous. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think uh, very often the hardest question for academics who have firmly entrenched uh, legal views and firmly entrenched moral views is what to do at the practical uh, level. And I'm going to ask you about that a little bit, Jerry, uh, because I think you open up uh, to that subject when you talk about American popular culture uh, and the ambivalent attitude that American popular culture uh, has toward uh, terrorism, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, towards uh, coercive uh, interrogation. Uh, it seems to be the one thing that is unsayable in American public political discourse is that the public is ever at fault with respect to anything because <laughs> the public is not uh, mature, reasonable. Um, everybody has to talk about the good sense of the uh, American uh, people. Uh, but I have some sense that a political leader who pushed hard in the direction uh, that you're saying political leaders ought to push in would be met with rebuke, as Obama was met with rebuke when he tried to close uh, Guantanamo, and as the Obama administration was met with rebuke when they tried uh, to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in a civil uh, court. Uh, so what, if anything, do you have by way of practical advice to political leaders uh, about how to make acceptable what, as a matter of law and morals, ought to be acceptable. Uh, so the first thing I want to say, uh, speaking with naive rigidity uh, as a human rights lawyer, uh, is that the United States has a legal obligation uh, to respond uh, to torture committed uh, under its authority. Um, it actually has a legal obligation of prosecution. Uh, that's not politically palatable, uh, and I can understand why the Obama administration uh, did not begin uh, its, uh, its career uh, by engaging in political prosecution of some of the people it was legally obliged uh, to prosecute. Truth commissions uh, are another uh, institution uh, that has been used uh, in other societies uh, to deal uh, with severe human rights uh, abuses of the past. Uh, and there were proposals uh, in Congress uh, for some kind of truth commission, or we wouldn't call it a truth commission, but uh, some kind of full-scale inquiry and airing. Um, the educative function uh, that institutions like the criminal law and that like truth commissions uh, can perform uh, are functions that can be form, performed without openly saying uh, we think the public are ignorant and need to be educated, uh, but they do have important uh, educative functions. Uh, 
Uh, there has been apparently some investigation, some uh, internal reports that have been written within the Justice Department uh, that have not been uh, made public. Um, there was uh, an internal investigation uh, of the behavior of the Office of Legal Counsel that took place within uh, the Justice Department, uh, which was then uh, rewritten uh, at a high level uh, in order to suppress the um, uh, recommendations of bar discipline uh, against members of the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, there are a variety of methods which would not have been politically popular uh, with the adherence of the prior administration, uh, and I can understand why uh, it would have taken great political courage uh, to do some of these things. Um, since, since I find myself in my, in my current position um, frequently recommending to other countries uh, that they muster the political courage to do some of these things that they're legally obliged to do, um, I, I guess the fact that it's, it would have been politically unpopular to do so uh, doesn't deter me from saying these are among the alternatives that the current administration should have explored. Anybody else on the panel a quick uh, comment on Jerry? Phil? Uh, <clears throat> to, to the extent that Jerry is arguing that a greater respect for rights you know, and talking about the importance of rights will uh, affect the American people, can affect the American people in a substantial way. I'm quite skeptical about that. I think that it's the, it's the reality of our fears that have to be addressed. I, in other words, I think that we have to find a mechanism for assessing the reality of our fears and for encouraging the willingness to take certain risks, all on that side of the equation. Because I don't think, uh, especially international human rights, will ever, in our lifetimes, uh, stand up uh, to a real fear of danger, to a substantial fear of danger to the American people. I, I just think that's a losing battle. I think you have to deal with the fear and deal with that by, it is a very difficult job. Okay, excellent. So we've got another hot topic uh, on hold uh, until uh, everybody's done. Uh, Trevor? Okay. Uh, well, let me start by uh, adding my thanks uh, to the organizers, especially Gabby and Ben. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to, to be here with you all and to be on this panel. Um, I'll. My remarks will, will sound like they're coming from the perspective of the executive branch, and so um, I should say that uh, obviously I don't speak for the administration. Um, I once worked for it, but uh, it's, it's been, um, I've been back in academia now for uh, longer than the time that I was, I was in the Obama administration, and these are my thoughts and not necessarily its. Um, and this is not just a brief for the executive branch, though I'm sort of going to, I guess, talk about future challenges um, in the register of the dilemma that uh, the government, uh, by which I principally mean the executive branch, uh, is faced with. Um, and I start with this uh, premise, and that's that, at least for the foreseeable future, um, I think the United States government's policies uh, with respect to counterterrorism are generally going to continue to be pragmatic. Uh, they will involve pursuing what you could call a kind of middle course, uh, embracing a range of policy options within um, some legal limits. Uh, other commentators uh, and observers might think those legal limits have been drawn in the right place, or they might not, but it, uh, that's the, the basic picture. Um, the, in the area of sort of detention and prosecution is where you see this best. I think that you know, the government has articulated a preference to uh, have uh, lawful options to uh, deal with people in its custody, either through prosecuting them in, in Article III courts, or in uh, the reformed military commission system, or to continue detaining them under authorities claimed uh, under the law of war. Um, I think John Brennan's talk uh, yesterday is, is maybe the best existing sort of statement of the current administration's pragmatic policy in this area, of a continuing embrace of a range of policy options. Um, 
uh, because that, that is sort of operationally smart and desirable and because uh, this administration believes that it's uh, legally permissible also. So Ben's quite right that this entails uh, rejecting the idea that the choice between military power and law enforcement is a false one, but that instead it's both, and the question is you know, when to use which, uh, and when and how to contemplate things that you might call sort of hybrid uses of power that, in that involve elements of each. Um, a major problem, and here I'm gonna continue the doom and gloom of the panel, is that the public debate tends to the extremes. It depicts, in particular, the uh, United States government, this administration, in caricatured terms. Uh, this is, I think, what we mean by the poisonous political climate in this area. Uh, and I'm afraid that I see these caricatures coming from both extremes. I'm reminded of that in, in the very couple of weeks when the government was uh, initially finalizing a, a forum selection for where to prosecute Khalid Sheikh Mohammed when the Attorney General was finalizing that decision, um, I think it was in that very week, there was appearing in one major national newspaper an op-ed by, I think it was John Yoo, saying that the problem with this administration when it comes to counterterrorism and national security is that President Obama rejects the idea that we are at war at all. Uh, in that same week, there was a large advertisement uh, in the op-ed pages of the New York Times run by, I think, Ben's employer, uh, that had a picture of President Obama sort of morphing into a picture of President Bush, um, as though that fully captured what the Obama administration was contemplating merely by thinking that it might prosecute someone in a military commission. I'm afraid that I see those two positions as uh, equally inaccurate and equally irresponsible and equally contributing to the poisonous political climate that the Obama administration is faced with. Uh, these kinds of extremist caricatures are always going to be threats to any middle position because they entail slippery slope arguments, right? And any middle position faces slippery slope based arguments against it. So I guess what I wanna sort of focus on then is a question, not the only, but a question going forward is whether the center can hold. Um, and to suggest that one problem here, and this isn't new, I don't think, uh, in any way, is, is a kind of fundamental lack of trust, in particular a, an interbranch um, lack of trust. Yes, there's, there's sheer political opportunism here, I think, which would make notions of interbranch trust kind of naive and silly even to talk about. But I think there's more than just political opportunism going on. I think there are some, a minority of people, but some in Congress who approach some of these issues with a, with a kind of seriousness and want to engage the real operational questions. And I think that's true of many in the executive branch too. Um, but I think there's a kind of mutual lack of trust between these two institutions. And I want to suggest that the courts come into the picture there too. On the executive side, um, often the executive branch during the last administration and this one in, in very different ways on the substance has not wanted to engage Congress on matters that could be the topics of legislation in this area for fear that the legislation that you know, might be yielded will be really bad in some way. Um, I think that's an understandable fear, but it, it comes from a kind of lack of trust in the, in the possibilities of engagement. On the legislative side, there is a pervasive belief these days, I think, that the executive, if given discretion to decide, say, in what forum to prosecute someone, or whether to transfer them from Guantanamo back to their home country or into the United States for purposes of prosecution, that if given any such discretion or allowed to keep it, it will exercise it in a bad way. There's just a lack of trust in the sort of ability or capability of the executive branch to behave responsibly. Um, so we get discretion-limiting legislation, uh, like the, the sort of uh, legislation that's now pending before Congress in the Defense Authorization Act. Legislation like this can force the executive branch's hand in ways that are liable to be both bad policy and extremely risky as a legal matter. So for example, as I think many, if not everyone in the room knows, um, the, the current language, unless it's changed very recently, I think contemplates things like mandating military custody of any effectively enemy combatant uh, taken into custody within the United States, mandating the use of military commissions instead of Article III courts to prosecute them, uh, et cetera, um, potentially expanding uh, the government's detention authority beyond uh, what it thinks is necessary and beyond what is liable to be legally defensible uh, in the courts. Um, 
Now, this, this, I, I want to sort of underscore not just that this can be bad policy, but that it can be exceptionally legally risky, right? If the government is forced into that sort of position, if the executive branch is, um, then I think the likelihood that the Supreme Court will find it necessary to intervene goes up. The experience of the last 10 years uh, teaches that. It's, I think, impossible to read Justice Kennedy's opinion in Boumediene, especially the last few paragraphs of it, and not see that he's basically saying the difference between even a few months earlier when, the, when he first voted in favor of denying certiorari in that case and the decision to grant cert and then to come out the way he did was a basic loss of faith on the part of the court that the political branches could be trusted to act responsibly in this area. Um, and if the executive branch is forced to pursue policies that it thinks are politically, uh, sorry, as a policy matter, unwise and legally risky, uh, sort of pushing the envelope in unnecessary areas, then the likelihood that the court will intervene goes up. And the likelihood goes up, I think, this is a, a point that's maybe uh, not often appreciated, if the court is then sort of inclined to strike down, inclined to strike down the policy, say to strike down the military commission system, or to strike down or to hold that the government lacks the authority militarily to, t to detain a set of people that is sort of mandated by legislation to detain, the court's decision in that direction is liable to go beyond um, what, as a policy matter, anyone think might as, think is optimal. So if, if the executive branch had been allowed to exercise some discretion, it would actually end up with more power than it's going to be left with when it loses the, the uh, issue before the Supreme Court. Uh, so there, too, I think it's a matter of trust. And the question then is how, if at all, can any of this trust be, uh, be rebuilt, be maintained? Um, trust in Congress, trust on the part of the people, if you want, uh, and the courts. Well, I can think of two things. Um, part of the answer, I think, is that the uh, government ought to be giving more speeches like John Brennan's. Um, that's, to my mind, there have been two really significant counterterrorism speeches uh, delivered by the Obama administration. The first was President Obama's speech at the National Archives in May of 2009, and the second is John Brennan's address yesterday. That is, what, what a speech like that can try to do is to pull together aspects of what the government has been doing and to provide a rationale for all of it so that skeptics can't say there is no policy here and they don't know what they're doing. And on the, on the left, they can't say, well, this is sort of you know, totally unrestrained and government run amok, but there can be a kind of account of, what, of the middle position that has a coherence to it, that has some meets and bounds to it, even if it's not hard-edged, and especially if, it's un if major aspects of it are unlikely to face judicial review. There needs to be a kind of more frequent and more detailed, I think, public articulation of the government's own theory of its actions and its policies. Um, and the other, I think, is uh, sort of showing, not just by giving speeches, but by doing, um, that that legal constraints and principled constraints on discretion are being observed within the executive branch. And that's about internal constraints within the executive branch. Uh, so that would range from adopting things like what the administration has uh, finally uh, made public, uh, the sort of plan to use a, peer, a system of periodic review uh, to continue to look at the Guantanamo detentions, even after the government has won a case in the, in the habeas litigation in the DC courts. Um, the discussion then could be, you know, how exactly should that review go, uh, who should be involved, what should be the sort of uh, proof thresholds required to continue the detention. But having a kind of follow-up regime like that in place I think is very important. And the other is uh, to commit itself, the executive branch to commit itself to continuing to take very seriously the sort of internal legal advisory checks provided especially by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel and others. And I'll just end on on that note, there have been recent claims uh, that uh, the legal checks provided by uh, offices like OLC are essentially a joke, um, that they aren't constraints at all, it's just a sham. Um, these are incorrect factually, but it's not inevitable that they will always be incorrect. Uh, it's going to take a kind of recommitment uh, to those institutions um, and to the legal constraints that they can provide. Um, I hope that that will happen, and I don't think that's naive, but whether, uh, you know, trust really can be restored in a branch is something about which I'm somewhat less optimistic. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
So the one thing everybody seems uh, united on is pessimism. Uh, and uh, rather than pushing Trevor uh, specifically uh, about uh, anything, maybe one short uh, uh, exchange among the panel and then we'll go uh, to the audience. And the principal, um, th th there's been an echoing theme, I think, about the need to establish a political climate in which sensible policies can be evolved and pursued. Uh, and after listening to each other uh, dealing with these questions, I just wondered if anybody has anything uh, that he uh, would like to say on that question before directly addressing each other before we go to the audience. Chair. Yes, I'd just like to respond to what uh, Phil said in response to my presentation, uh, which is just the following. Uh, I didn't mean to argue that uh, the thing that the United States needed to do uh, was educate the public on the need to respect international human rights, qua international human rights. Uh, international human rights are implemented in national systems in a variety of ways, and implementing our international human rights obligations through our own national values uh, is a perfectly acceptable way of implementing international human rights. Uh, and I agree that merely stressing the uh, rights dimension uh, is not a sufficient uh, way of persuading the public. I think that the things that you're talking about are also uh, quite important, uh, but I think that if we're attempting to try to prevent what happened in the past from recurring, uh, as we should be, uh, then also acting against the legacy uh, of the previous administration uh, and the active defense of the legacy uh, of the previous administration uh, is an important step that will need to be taken at some point in the future if we wish to prevent uh, a recurrence. Anybody else? Phil? Uh, I'd just like to add one thing sort of factually, and because it's a very big fact that we haven't talked about as, the, as a result of how our panel was defined. The fact of the matter is we aren't using the law of war with regard to uh, U.S. persons or anybody in the United States. Now, we can find that you can find a Padilla occasion that you referred to, Dick, that we did, and we'll, we may have decided we're going to try and kill the American Al Qaeda member in Yemen. But in general, the biggest division is between our activities abroad and our activities at home. The, what we've done, and it's, and it's politically very satisfactory to those who manage it, is to guarantee that we use only law enforcement at home, despite McCain, Letterman, uh, Le Lieberman, and uh, use any war powers we're going to use abroad. That, that's, that is what our position is at the end of 10 years. Right. But when you, in your initial presentation, Phil, you seem to be pushing against uh, that, saying that there had, there, I, thought, I thought I understood you uh, to say that there had come to be acceptance of the idea that military commissions could be used to try American citizens here in the United States, which would suggest the extension of the military uh, war model into the United States, at least in part. Well, people are arguing for it, but I think, there, I think there is a large political fund of opposition to uh, subjecting Americans or any, less so anyone else within the United States, but that's the mm -hmm. category now, either of those categories to military, to the law of war. Right. And no such opposition to subjecting aliens abroad to the law of war. Right. So at least one uh, possibility for uh, hope about where responsible politicians might be able to draw uh, lines in a way that would 
incur the support rather than the derision of the public. So at this point, I think we're confronted with a tragic uh, choice and a tragic choice with a clear uh, resolution. I think it's been fascinating, panelists. Thank you uh, so much. To the people in the line, I'm going to volunteer the panelists to stay right here uh, and to answer your questions during the lunch break or before the lunch break starts. Uh, and with that, thank you again, panelists, and thank you to the audience. <laughs>